Namaste, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. My name is Ashley. I am a co-series editor of the Analyzing Australian History series and a contributing author to one of the four books. I'd like to start this session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet virtually today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. The purpose of today's session is to answer your questions about new Cambridge textbooks for the upcoming VCE history study designed for 2022. I will introduce the authors in attendance before we open up the floor to questions. We have the following authors in attendance ready to answer any questions you may have. I would just ask each author in turn to turn their camera, uh, turn on their camera and unmute themselves. Say a quick hello when I introduce you. So firstly, from our first text, From Custodianship to the Anthropocene, we have in attendance, firstly, my second, my fellow series editor and co-author, Richard Broom, uh, who is here with us. Richard is uh, someone who is well known to the history teaching community, patron of the HTAV, emeritus professor of history, president of the Royal Historical Society and well-published author on aspects of Australian history. Uh, joining Richard is Dr. David Harris, who has taught in regional and metropolitan Victorian government high schools, in addition to undertaking um, academic research in environmental history at La Trobe and Monash universities. Uh, the other two authors, Mr. Jeff Peel and Mr. James Grout, could not join us today. To answer your questions about our second uh, text, Creating a Nation, we have Emeritus Professor Marion Quarterly, who's taught and researched Australian history over the last 50 years, um, she's recently commit, completed a family history of her own uh, that contributes to both her family's history and South Australian history. Ms. Jess Chamoff and Graham Davidson couldn't be with us today, uh, but we do have Richard who can help also answer some questions on creating a nation. Uh, to answer your questions about power and resistance, we're lucky to be joined by Mr. Bill Lewis, who is a senior history and geography teacher here in Melbourne, who has taught extensively on Australian history over a number of years. Uh, Mr. James Jacobs, who is also an experienced Australian history teacher over the past 12 years in Melbourne and has been a VC assessor. Miss Angie Pollock couldn't be with us today. Uh, and we also have myself, who is an author for Power and Resistance. And then finally, uh, for the fourth and uh, final book in the series, War and Upheaval, we have Miss Helen Smalley, who has taught history, humanities and English uh, for 16 years and uh, also been a VCAA assessor as well. Uh, Miss Jenny Pudney, who has been a teacher for over 10 years, teaching VC Australian history and other subjects. And Mr Ian Keyes, who has taught history for nearly 40 years, including 30 as a head of a hist uh, various history faculties. Dr. Michael Adcock couldn't be with us today. Finally, to help uh, answer questions uh, about power and resistance, uh, as I mentioned previously, I will be able to jump in. And my name is Ashley. I'm a history teacher here in Melbourne. Uh, and um, I really sort of love and enjoy all aspects of history education in addition to work I do with the HTAV and other organizations. But that's enough of us. Let's move on to the questions. So we're lucky that we've had a few questions that have been emailed through to us before the session, which we'll start with those. And then if anyone in the audience has any additional questions, I invite you to throw them in the chat and we can uh, look at them after we go through our pre-prepared questions that we have. So to start with, the first question we have is why are these books being published? Why is Australian history worth saving? And we're going to go through one person from each of the four books to answer that, starting with Richard. Thank you very much, Ashley. Look, I'm delighted to, to talk to this because I am very passionate about Australian history. I have worked in it for uh, over, well over 30 years. It's been good to me personally, but it's been a source of endless fascination. I think that the thing about Australia is that it has three great achievements and that can be explored when you do Australian history. Firstly, we have one of the oldest indigenous cultures in the world and uh, dating back to well over 50,000, 60,000 years in our country. 
that is worthy of our study just for that. It's been a most remarkable society that has sustained itself through long periods of climatic change and uh, has produced a society that uh, has deep spiritual connections to the land. So that's one thing that's a great achievement that we should take note of. Secondly, it's, we have a great democratic achievement in Australia. We're one of the oldest democracies. Of course, it started off as a partial democracy and finally uh, women and then Indigenous people fought their way into that democracy. So we have an extremely proud record, particularly in, this, in a world that's uh, um, being pressed hard by autocratic and uh, uh, organisations and regimes and societies. So we have that to celebrate. And I hope every time someone goes to the ballot box, they think of the Chartists who fought so hard for the right for us to vote. And thirdly, we have a great multicultural achievement. And again, we're one of the standouts in the modern world of being able to get along as a multicultural society. So these are the three great things. And so they're a sort of an intellectual argument for, for why we should do Australian history. But also we need uh, a more utilitarian approach about citizenship. There is a need for truth telling in our society. We still have many unresolved problems as a colonising society. And so in Victoria, we have a Yaruk commission about to start. So this is important for us to face the truth of the past. We also need to do so to just to understand ourselves and to, for us to place ourselves in the modern world in the right contexts. And we can do that through studying Australian history. And lastly, I would argue that it's um, important for our intelligent citizenship. You know, sometimes amazes me when I hear that there's about a million young people not enrolled to vote in the next federal election, for instance. And that's been happening for well over 10 or so years. And so um, young people need to be drawn in to uh, become intelligent citizens. And you can do that through Australian history. So they're the things that I would emphasise. Thanks, Richard. Let's go on with the same question. Why these books or why and why study Australian history? Let's go to Marion next. Why do you think Australian history is worth saving? I think Richard just stole all my thunder, I think. Um, I oh, very, God. very much agree with, with where he's coming from. I'm perhaps slightly more critical than him. I, I would stress that a nation that has no history has no memory and that when you have no memory of the past, you're doomed to repeat the failures of the past. And those failures have been, from the perspective of the present, quite striking. And they've shaped people's understandings in a way that doesn't, it's not immediately obvious. So I, I do think that I would encourage every young person to get a decent understanding of the history of Australia so that they can assess the kind of attitudes that are currently here now and their own attitudes. I mean, teaching Australian history for many years, I have seen students, the great light bulb moment um, when they, uh, they suddenly understand that something that they've taken for, for granted is actually a historical construct and that they can then separate them, set themselves from it in a way. So I'm extremely anxious that we are losing our memory as a nation. I find that that's very upsetting. And uh, the more that we can do to kind of, but we also have to make it interesting for students. We also have to make it engaging. Not, it's not just a, <laughs> it's not just a, a set of dreadful errors, but I do believe that it can be done. And that that's what we're trying to do in this instance. Marion, could you just talk also, something you've said to me in the past, is the past is a foreign country. Would you like yes. to talk to that? Yes. Um, I think students, when they look back to the past, tend to read it as if it was now. And one of the great things that you can do is to make them understand that even 15 years ago, words didn't mean the same as they mean now. And if you go back 200 or more years, 
it, it's, it is a very, very foreign country. And the way that we've tried, I'm now going to get on to further down the track, but the way that we try to do that in these books, I think all of us, is by working very closely from the original documents and making them vivid and engaging and understandable to the students, but understandable with a bit of a leap of imagination, with a way of, you know, an opening of the door perhaps um, that otherwise wouldn't be available to them. Thanks so much, Marion. Bill, what about you? Why is Australian history worth saving? Well, I mean, I, I think, first of all, someone whose accent will instantly ping them as someone whose origins are not in this country. I just think it's it's a fascinating history in its own right. I came to Australian history in a sense as a bit of a stranger, as, as not part of my own background as, a, as someone raised in Canada. Uh, but the story of Australia, for all the reasons that Richard and Marion have been talking about, is an inherently fascinating one. And it's one that if, if I can bring it uh, to, you know, the books themselves and what gap they can fill uh, for teachers in terms of how they're going to use them in the classroom, there's a lot of stories in them that I think students will be able to draw connections to, to their own lives, and that a good teacher will help them make those connections, and that they'll be able to build that bridge from the past uh, into the present. And I thinking about the volume in particular that I worked upon, the power and resistance one, it really gives students an opportunity to um, delve into things that they haven't maybe had an opportunity to look at before, such as um, women's rights, both through the colonial period, uh, which, you know, one of the world leading nations in terms of women's suffrage and things like that, and the debates that went on there, as well as, you know, more recent debates uh, from the 20th century about, you know, the roles of women and the rights of women. Uh, the opportunity to explore, you know, marginal groups within the society, how they have fought, uh, whether it's from the LGBT QI population or whether it's Aboriginal Australians or different people who have been making claims for their own civil and political rights uh, in society over the last you know, 40 years. And I think those are things that students can really engage with. And I think um, that's important for them to be as engaged citizens, as Richard mentioned, that idea of, of active citizenship uh, and not to be wearing a black armband or overly critical of the place that they grow up because there's a lot of uh, definitely things that we can celebrate uh, about Australia, but to be knowledgeable, to be coming from a place of knowledge, to have an opportunity, as Marion said, to go back to some of the documents, some of the speeches or the images uh, that really provoked some of these debates or were part of the perspectives put forward. Um, and that putting that in the classroom in a senior history course that can be stimulating, uh, engaging, uh, and really also accessible, which I think is an important part that we should highlight with regards to Australian history, is that we can make links for students uh, in ways that I think can really make this an accessible history for them to explore. So those are all things that I think that the series helps draw out of the current study design, and that the study design itself really can help facilitate uh, debates and discussions about the world that our students live in. Thanks so much, Bill. Finally to Helen, what about your perspective? Why is history worth saving? Well, can you see me? Oh, fine. Okay. Um, I would firstly ask the question of why wouldn't we study Australian history? Um, I concur with everything everybody else has said, but it concerns me that our, so many of our students leave high school and they're not informed um, participants. They're not ready to be informed participants in the national life. And I think that's what our subject gives them, that foundation where they can make informed uh, decisions based on knowledge and understanding. The other really key thing for me is when I was looking at uh, writing for War and Upheaval, um, I had to go into some areas I'd never looked at previously. And I was struck by the number of times that there were, there were events 
and comments in um, the media in the current moment that had their basis in things I was looking at between 1950 and 1992. Um, an example, for instance, is uh, we're now looking in our section, War and Upheaval, at the evolution of the ADA, ADF, the Australian Defence Force, and people, uh, diverse groups within the community. And recently we had Peter Dutton making a comment about um, he didn't want, uh, what was it? at morning tea to celebrate um, diversity in the armed services because the uh, focus should be on combat. Well, suddenly that has a context now and I think it's important for our students to be aware of. Uh, and also the current ideas about racism that are percolating in the community with um, Tex Walker, et cetera, incredibly relevant. And this is a subject that will give them some context. So. Everything, I support everything everyone else said. Thanks so much, Helen. So the second of our uh, big questions that have been sent through to us is very much which, you know, why should schools choose a particular topic? We've got four topics and schools have to choose two of them. So which two should they choose? And so we'll go through a different representative from each author team to just talk about what, what it is about their particular area that they worked on that um, might appeal to students, to teachers and to schools. So firstly, to David Harris on custodianship to the Anthropocene. Uh, thanks, Ash. Um, it's, it's interesting what people have been saying about the, the way uh, that there's resonance uh, with um, issues at the moment and those that they've been looking at. And I, um, I don't want to have a, an OK Boomer moment, but it just occurred to me that um, when I did Australian history, it coincided with uh, Vietnam conscription. And so what was important for us was the First World War and the conscription debates. Nothing, we, we weren't really interested in other aspects of it. And it seems to me now that there's a similar pivotal moment um, whether it's to do with the climate emergency, whether it's to do with the uh, conflict between politics and science over uh, the pandemic. And there's, there seem to be so many resonances. But with, um, with the areas that I worked on, which was uh, looking at the four environmental debates and uh, in the uh, from the 1950s through to the 1970s, and also looking at nuclear energy. The, the nuclear debates, uh, there's an alarming resonance that we seem to have come full circle again, that there's discussion of those, uh, that aspect of uh, looking for um, energy. Um, in, in looking at uh, the work that I did, uh, the reason why I think it, it's uh, worth doing is because it, cha it cha challenges uh, a lot of popular assumptions about the environmental movement, about um, the, the ways in which environmentalism was something that was suddenly discovered in the 1970s, where the nuclear debates, uh, in fact, were uh, around in the 1950s, the labour movement was involved, and there's a much longer history um, than is acknowledged. And one of the other things that I think is important in looking at the environmental movement is this aspect of the historiography, of looking at who, who is writing the history. And quite often, the history of the environmental movement is, is, has been written by those people who were involved in it. So it's important for students when when looking at those uh, sources, as Marion was saying, the importance of having documents to look at and documents to contrast, that uh, they look at uh, what's being said, why, who, who is saying it and why is it being said. Um, similarly, with uh, the four environmental movements, quite often, the, the stories of the Franklin River have been tied to the to the rise of the Greens, and the the saving of the Franklin was really bound up with uh, the uh, a, a heritage 
uh, listing of um, an Aboriginal cave. So it, it wasn't so much about the success of the Greens. It was, it was, and it's particularly interesting to look at the, the tensions between the Green movement at that time who relied on wilderness as an idea, as a concept, and that was important in progressing their political ideals. And uh, one of the other aspects which comes out of this chapter is challenging those popular, the, the use of um, uh, terms in which have, are just accepted as though wilderness um, is, is clear to everybody. But once you look at environmental history, students will, I hope, begin to develop a much more nuanced understanding of terms like wilderness. And to conclude, I, I think, I, I was when I was thinking about this, um, there were so many, and in terms of what I was saying about this being a pivotal time, uh, apart from nuclear energy, there, there's also, um, in, in, earlier in the book, there's Richard's, uh, discussion of Dark Emu, uh, which, and th there's there's a book which is a polemic. And for the first for the first time at Christmas, we were talking about Murnyongs. And the only reason we were talking about Murnyongs is because of um, a book like uh, Dark Emu. So there seems to be uh, a, a really a lovely confluence of the arrival of uh, environmental history into VCE and at the same time there are a, there are a whole range of social issues uh, which students uh, will be able to engage with with a, with a much more informed understanding. Thanks so much David. Um, the second of our books, Creating a Nation. Richard, we'll throw that one over to you. Why should uh, students be or teachers be interested in that? Uh, You're on mute. <laughs> so it's the phrase of the of the age. If I if I can just uh, cheat a little bit and talk about volume one as well, because I wrote the first half of volume one, and uh, I've done Aboriginal history for a very long, long time, but it was only when I started to do and read more environmental history with colleagues at La Trobe about fifteen years ago that I saw that the elephant in the room was the struggle over land. Uh, and I always knew that in a sense, but I, I saw it much more clearly because of that. So really for, for me, custodianship to the Anthropocene is really about the way uh, there's a struggle for power over land in the, in the, in the context of colonisation, which is the big story of Australian history. We are a, a colonial society and colonization has had a massive impact and still is in, in, in our society, even to things like Aboriginal health today and suicide rates and whatever. So for me, the first part of that book gives a very strong uh, view of how uh, environmental history comes together with Indigenous history. But I also worked on creating a nation and I wrote the second half of that book and for me, the movement of peoples is one of the big themes in modern history. Modernity is about mobility. And in the early 19th century, Europe started to get on the move. 50 million people left Europe in that period, and a number of them came to distant Australia. So it, it's a massive story about internal and external migration. That is the story of modern history in a sense. And so we're, we're telling an Australian part of that story. And that story is, the, again, the story of colonisation, um, but also, um, again, about massive change within that Australian story of British immigration, because after 1945, the face of Australia is totally uh, shifted by the need for Australia to populate or perish. That's the a situation that the second half of the volume starts with. And of course, this leads to massive debates which students can get engaged in about who belongs and who doesn't belong. And these were fought out and, and Marion might like to say a few things about the first part of that volume, but these are fought out in the late 19th century. What is going to be the part of indigenous people in this colonized society? 
what is the part of those who are brought as forced sometimes and sometimes voluntary labour onto the cane fields? Uh, these are the questions that, that are fought out as, as Australia is starting to think about itself as becoming a nation. So it, it's a, a fantastic um, set of problems for students to get their teeth in. And these problems roll on into the present day about refugees, about debates, um, about our big first flow of refugees from, from um, uh, Asia in the 1980s and the, and the end of the Vietnam War. So massive questions that students can get their teeth in. So they're not only important questions, they're relevant questions, and I think they're interesting questions. So much, Richard. Um, let's move on to our third book, Power and Resistance. James, what can you tell us about Power and Resistance? Um, thanks, thanks, Ash. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been listening to everyone speak and, and I'd like to say I think they're all really valuable and interesting topics and as a current teacher myself I'm having trouble deciding between them but like I will say that we, we will choose to do um, power and resistance and I think Richard spoke earlier about um, the need to try and engage students with, with the stories of Australian history and I think that this, this theme is a really, really engaging theme. Um, but for me it's a story of struggle, it's about individuals and groups who um, you know, pushed against existing power structures to try and improve uh, working conditions and ways of life uh, for themselves and for others. Um, it's about those power structures that often hindered, but then also sometimes helped those struggles as well. Um, the course studies Australia's early democracy and it, it features the push towards gender justice, um, the growth of the union movement and how that informed the growth of the Labor Party and advancing workers' rights, albeit not as far as they might have hoped. Um, but it is also like similar to the previous unit that Richard was describing, a story of racial prejudice and discrimination. And um, sorry to keep quoting Richard, but he talked about truth telling. And I think it's important that, you know, the students learn about dispossession and the violence that took place, but it also restores um, the agency of Aboriginal peoples as well. It talks about how they survived that colonization and preserved their culture. Um, so I think thematically that the, the unit follows sort of three key fault lines in Australian history, uh, gender, race, and class. And so it follows those three themes through into unit four. Um, and the second unit emphasizes that, that sense of continuity, that ongoing struggle. So um, it's a really good unit for uh, demonstrating change in continuity, changes in terms of um, new struggles like the, uh, the advancement of our LGBTQIA plus rights um, and some of the gains that were made. But also that sense of continuity as well, like that the struggle is ongoing for economic equality for women or um, the continuing fight for land rights for Aboriginal people. So, yeah, I think, I think uh, an engaging story of struggle, um, about three big concepts, race, class and gender, and um, really strong illustration of uh, both change and continuity in Australian history. Thanks so much, uh, James. I have to be an impartial mod uh, moderator today, but yeah. Obviously, taking part in the writing of Power and Resistance is such a fascinating story, as, as they all are. So, um, mm. Ian, what can you tell us about War and Upheaval? Um, I'm, I'm going to focus on the volume I worked on, and that was the Unit 2, covering the period 1950 to 1992. And because of my age, it's an actual period I lived through. My earliest memory of overseas is the Korean War. But today, as we withdraw from Afghanistan and face increasing tensions in our relationship with China, this study allows students to explore, I think, four areas in depth. First of all, through a study of the Korean and Vietnamese wars, students can explore aspects of our relationship with both the United Nations in the beginning and, of course, the United States. Also, which is quite new to many people, the beginning of our independent relationships with our Southeast Asian neighbours, with Malaysia and Indonesia. Thirdly, the debates about conscription. It won't go away. If we're threatened again, you know, the issue may arise again. So it's important to, to deal with that. And how the armed forces have responded to questions of discrimination often slower than the rest of the community. So discrimination on grounds of race, gender or sexual preference. And sometimes how these things were hidden 
you know, that there were gay men, there were indigenous men in the armies, but they were hidden, you know, from the from view. Now, one other thing I gained from this was looking at the political leaders of the time, because you now their role becomes important in these events. So when you look at people like Chifley, Robert Menzies, Arthur Corwell, Gough Whitlam, Dr. Ebert, you think maybe there was something there that we're lacking if we look at the you know, recent uh, political events here. There was often you know, true leadership, uh, vigorous debate, um, using the English language correctly. Uh, there's so much there that we can gain from that as well. So thanks for that, Ash. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, the third of, uh, we've had you know, three pre-prepared questions. So we'll go to the third one now. Um, which is what approach has been taken to the writing of the text? And there might be some, you know, there was a similar approach taken to all four, but we'll still go to one of each of the authors uh, of the team to talk about how they have approached creating the text. Um, we'll throw it back to Richard to talk about custodianship. You're on mute, Richard. Maybe someone will talk about the commonalities of the volumes in approach, and perhaps you could do that, Ash, later. But in terms of um, the approach of my part, particularly, and I think David Harris would agree about his second part, was the starting point is that everything comes from nature. Now, this might seem very banal in a way, but it's something that the people living in cities often forget. They have no connection with where their food and their products come from that make all the things on their desk and the things they consume every day. And it's important because we've got one planet Earth that this is something that people into the future know about. So the other thing that, that marks it off is the notion, the idea that nature and culture are entwined. And so they both shape each other. And we can see that in the, in the one continent, Aboriginal people came up with a, a completely different uh, idea about how to use land than did Europeans. And that's because of the ideas that are played out in the heads of, of each of those. So the book, the book lays out ideas, of course, that's what the study design asks for. What were the ideas that were shaping the perspective? So, um, volume one, I think, is very careful to lay out in great detail the ideas, uh, and it's done clearly because there's a section called ideas in each of the books, and there's a section called perspectives. And in a sense, while they may be somewhat divorced from each other, when in reality they're not, I think it helps students to be able to see very clearly the ideas that they have to master and then see how they're played out. And so I would argue that volume one shows how revolutionary Australian history is, because if you look at the, um, the, the, the land as it was in 1788 and what it quickly became, you'll see there's a massive transformation, a revolutionary change, and that's accompanied by a revolutionary change in land use. So in the end, really, it's about power as much as volume three is, it's about who wields power and then can put in place their vision of what the land is to be and the relationship they have within the land. And this le leads to massive debates, firstly between Aboriginal people and colonists, but later on in the second half that David Harris has done, it leads to debates within uh, Australian society itself. How is nature and human um, relationships to play out. And so we see a shift in the second half of that volume where the, the, the idea of the Anthropocene is starting to dawn on people that they're having an impact on the planet that's leading to a new age where humans intervention can make a difference to what's happening to the world. Uh, but there's also a counter view that we need to care for nature played out in land care and a whole lot of other things. So, you know, there's fantastic debates and I think we've tried to bring them out in this volume. Thanks so much, uh, Richard. 
Marion, what about creating a nation? What approach has been taken to the writing? I think that when people think about migration and immigration and Australia being a nation of immigrants, they generally start uh, with after the Second World War. Migrants are people who come from Europe and then later from Asia. But the perspective that we took was to really, in a sense, unsettle the notion of British migration so that people would then have a, a, a much more extended understanding of the, the, the nature of Australian migration. And we asked the questions that people have asked, I think, about the 20th century, about the 19th century to a large degree, like, um, why did people come? <laughs> what was in their heads when they came? Did they came, come because they really had very little choice uh, or did they come on, on the, in a spirit of optimism? And we did that by looking at a lot of different people of trying to get inside their heads, trying to present their words, or at least trying to present the the context in which they were living in, in a way that you could actually understand them. Um, we looked at what happened to them when they first got here, uh, what the opportunities available to people were and the degree to which they didn't have those the opportunities. And we also looked at the culture they brought with them. So it means that we, we did present the set of understandings that the British brought with them and then that is then in a sense unsettled in the, the second half of the, the volume. And I think again, to get back to the use of documents, um, if I can just give one example of one of my favorite uses of documents, um, we use Caroline Chisholm. Now she was somebody who was organizing immigration and she was somebody who was working with the young immigrant women when they got here. And there's a lovely letter that she published with commentary from a man out in the country who wrote to her asking her to find him a wife. And she said this was the only case in which she actually sent a young woman into the country with the idea that she might be marrying a specific man, although, of course, she believed very strongly that she should be providing husbands, well, putting these women in a context where they would get husbands because that was the, the, the proper thing, that was what they wanted themselves. And perhaps it was, but uh, in this particular document, uh, it, it, she explains how she sent a young woman not to stay with this gentleman, but to a neighboring place where she could be employed and uh, a couple of um, older, an older couple to look after her on the way. And she says that within a month, the man wrote back to her saying, so thank you very much. We're happy to settle and we'll be married um, as soon as the bands are called. <laughs> I asked the students with a bit of help from, um, uh, what's the young woman's name who was helping us with the exercises? Uh, Jess. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. And I asked the, that we could have an exercise in which I, we, we looked at this and said, Whose voice is missing from this whole conversation? <laughs> Sit down and try and imagine perhaps that you're writing a letter home and you are the young woman whose voice is missing from the conversation and it's telling your family about your experiences at the end of your immigration. So I, I think that we were asking the students to really use their imagination to get in and in a way uh, unsettle, I think, some of the, of the the more general interpretations that have been given of all of these experiences. Thanks so much, Marion. About power, to, I'll take this aspect for power and resistance. Um, power and resistance is, uh, James covered a lot of the, the sort of topics that we approach. And I'll mention a few things which are very common throughout the entire series that we have, which is that you, for those teachers, those VCE teachers who know the study design, uh, and if you look at some of the other unit three and fours, like the revolution course, it has a very big focus on cause and consequence. Obviously, cause and consequence is important in Australian history as well, but when the study design has a particular emphasis on continuity and change, 
and continuity and change across the breadth of Australian history. And the text really does bring that to the fore uh, for the student um, in understanding what is it the changes that are happening and then what are the continuities that you can trace across Australian history uh, that thread their way through the different experiences of, of groups, individuals uh, across the, the breadth of um, their experience uh, here. And so it's something that we focused on really, really carefully to bring that to the fore to assist the students in that. If we look at the nuts and bolts of the text, because, uh, you know, we're, we're fairly, as, as teachers, we also like to make sure that we are preparing our students for the um, experiences that they'll have in exams and assessments and things like that. So we, we worked really carefully to ensure that we had a variety of student activities throughout the texts uh, that really tapped in quite strongly to developing the skills that are outlined in the study design in a very methodical and rigorous way so that as students progress through, uh, they're developing those skills in preparation for their, um, their SACs, for their ex externally assessed exam at the end of the course as well. Uh, and when, if you see, if you look at some of the page proofs that are on the website, you'll be able to see some of those activities in the page proofs there that are focused on some of those different skills like continuity and change, cause and consequence, significance. These are the things that students will have to demonstrate some understanding of uh, in their external exam that they do. But if we move on to the last text, uh, Jen, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you approached uh, writing it for war and upheaval? Our approach was to ensure that every element of the study design was covered. So as a teacher, if I'm buying a textbook and if I'm asking my students to buy one, I want to make sure that it covers uh, everything that is in the study design. So we approached it that way and we're very careful about that. We made sure that all of our sources are really interesting and would be interesting to students and that they were balanced because I think that's always really important. And then on top of that, we have an extensive extended reading list so that uh, as teachers you can um, ensure that your students are uh, if they're interested in something that they have uh, other uh, texts to look at as well to extend their learning we have timelines in every chapter uh, having taught year 12 Australian history myself every student loves a timeline I think it helps for them it helps them to uh, find out exactly where they are and where they're going so that's included uh, in all of the books as well our questions are tailored, as Ashley mentioned, uh, to reflect what that what may appear in uh, their exams. So practicing and building their skills all the way along. Uh, and in our book, uh, we focused on things that haven't been studied in Australian history before. For specifically in war and upheaval, we're looking at the influence of war commemoration and memorials, um, open service in the ADF, pop culture that emerged after the Vietnam War and the Malayan emergency and the Indonesian confrontation. So my response here today is really as a teacher, uh, we, wrote all, we wrote it in mind with what will the students find interesting and what do the teachers need uh, to help support them to deliver a fantastic unit. Thank you. Thanks so much. So those were our questions that were sent through before. We've got an opportunity now for questions from the audience. Um, so that's either you can either unmute yourself and ask your question live, or if you prefer, you can throw your question into the chat uh, and I'll be happy to read it out as well. So do we have any questions from the audience? Always the audience. Waiting for question. I'd like to, to say that uh, it's been a magnificent because there's been 15 that have worked Really, yeah, uh, in turn, breaking up a bit there, Richard. They've worked really hard to meet lines of getting the books out in time for the start of uh 2022. So they'll, they'll be coming out uh from uh September, October to December. Uh, but of course, you can see sample pages now, so it's been effort each of the books are over 300 pages long they just cover everything in design books and also 
writing the author is very hard to make sure we do match specifically the, uh, the key knowledge in, in study design. So it's going to be a, a great package for teachers, new and old, to teach these four themes. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'd just like to acknowledge what Cambridge has done to do this, not thinking they're going to make any sort of profit at all. And something that hasn't been mentioned is that uh, the, all the authors uh, have given their royalties to the Indigenous Reading Project, which is a, an amazing thing to do. And um, Cambridge is going to match all that. So uh, really, uh, there's a very strong social good behind these volumes. We've got a question here uh, from the audience in the chat that says, is there any recommendation from the authors about which two texts may work best together or which texts might support understanding and ideas uh, across the two options? I might, because I mean, I, I have the power here, so I might actually ask Bill to see if he has any thoughts on this question about which two, is there two that work better together or not? Well, I think any of them can work uh, incredibly well uh, in combination. So I don't necessarily see uh, natural pairings or pairings that might stand out as saying, oh, well, if you do custodianship to the Anthropocene, then you must do power and resistance because you could just, just as easily take up any of the other topics as well. One thing that I've often thought is that teachers, probably when they're thinking about which ones um, that are when they're thinking about which ones they're going to choose as units or investigations to teach there's probably two considerations one is your own areas of expertise as a teacher and what you've taught in the past and what you feel most confident in uh, and the other bit is what you think your students will be interested in what will engage them and what's the context uh, of your school so for example you, you know you might be teaching in a school with a very large multicultural community, a lot of migrants, and you might feel that the stories of creating a nation are things that are really going to resonate within your school community. Uh, you might feel that your students have got a profound interest in some of the environmental history and the connections both into the deep time history of Aboriginal peoples as well as the more current uh, debates about um, climate and the environment that a historical perspective can give them. So I don't, I, I think any of the two could work well together. And like I said, I think those two main reflections, what are your experiences as a teacher and what are you going to bring uh, to bring the text alive in your classroom? And what do you think is going to engage your students? Thanks, Bill. Were there any other comments on that question from our panel members? You might want to jump in with a comment. Hello. Could I, hello. Yes. Uh, could I just add that um, uh, Michael Adcock wasn't here today to talk about his section of War and Upheaval, which is 1909 to 1950. Uh, so I just wanted teachers to be aware of that continuum. Um, and so when I've been thinking about it myself, you know, what would I teach? I sort of think, well, creating a nation and war and upheaval, there's a nice continuity there. And it shows how the new nation responded to uh, the upheavals of the 20th century. And the other, only other point I would make too is that um, the, well, I'm plugging my own book, but anyway, <laughs> I just, uh, the, it's also worth looking at what's offered in year 11 units one and two and to see what might complement what they've already done or, you know, extend what they know. So that's just my thoughts. Thanks, Helen. Was there anyone else who had any comments on that question? Oh, well, I just wanted to endorse what Bill said, you know, a fantastic uh, uh, answer to it as a practising teacher. And um, I, I, I think uh, we all, in, in the end, see it as not our book, but our books. And we would be delighted if the whole books strengthen Australian history. And we would be delighted if you had a really tough time deciding, because that shows that the people who did the study design came up with four really dynamic, interesting themes and I don't think you're going to lose out 
doing any of them or making any sorts of combination. Uh, so I really just uh, believe that. And, and so it's a great opportunity to consolidate and hopefully strengthen and grow Australian history. Thanks, Richard. Anyone else? Um, can you hear me, Ian? Yeah, go on, Ian. Um, I have actually done, prepared like a short essay on all the seven possibilities of combinations. So if anyone wants to contact uh, Cambridge, I'm happy and then send my email um, to them. I'm happy to uh, circulate that among anybody interested. Fantastic, that would be great. Any more questions from our audience? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or throw one in the chat. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like uh, we've covered all the questions prepared and live that, we have, that we've had for this afternoon. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of our attendees from our author teams. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you so much for the Cambridge team for all the work they've done to support this project uh, and help us get these books from being an idea that was discussed over a pub in Port Melbourne, I think it was, um, Nick, and then uh, somehow in a, in a rapid time, they seem to be materialising before our eyes. So uh, this has been a fantastic project to be a part of. Um, hey, hey, Ash, can I just jump in? I noticed that Nick has put Ian's document up in the chat. Uh, so if people were particularly interested in, in reading Ian's thoughts, on that, if you jump into the chat now, you can download that Word document uh, before we finish up. Yeah, thanks, but thanks for that, Bill. So grab that document there, um, a chance to uh, look over some of um, Ian's considered thoughts. Thank you so much, Ian, for that. Thank you for coming. Have a very good afternoon, everyone. If you have, uh, I've got, oh, I've got this other slide here. Uh, that if you wanted any more information, feel free to reach out to our um, sales teams at Cambridge. Um, anything that you want to know, let us know. Uh, but thank you for coming and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye. Much appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ash. Thanks a lot, everyone.